Let's pray. Our Father and our God, once again we approach your throne because we need your help. This is a very, very important subject on the Antichrist sitting in the temple of God. And we need divine wisdom. We need understanding from on high. And so we ask for your presence through the ministration of the Holy Spirit. I ask, Lord, that you will give us tender hearts and open minds to receive the truth as it is in Jesus. And we thank you for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. In our last study, we analyzed what the Bible has to say about the Antichrist. And we were studying the passage of the Apostle Paul that is found in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And basically, we noticed that in the Christian world, there are two ideas concerning the identity of the Antichrist. The first idea is that the Antichrist was a nasty individual that arose in Old Testament times called Antiochus Epiphanes, who lived between 171 and 164 B.C. Other Christians, mainly conservative Christians, believe that the Antichrist is a future nasty individual who's going to arise uh, and sit in a rebuilt Jewish temple after the rapture of the church. In other words, for most Christians in the world, the Antichrist either already came in the distant past or the Antichrist has not yet come. But in our last study, we noticed that the first stage of the Antichrist has already taken place in Christian history. Because scripture tells us that the Antichrist was going to sit in the temple of God and the temple of God represents the church. And so it is a system that claims allegiance to Jesus Christ, but actually betrays Jesus Christ, even though it professes to serve him and to preach him. Now we want to begin today where we left off in our last lecture. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 5. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 5 tells us that the Apostle Paul had already told these things to the Thessalonians. They already knew everything that he had said that we studied last time. Notice 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 5. Here the Apostle Paul says, Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? In other words, this shouldn't be new to you. I've already talked to you about the Antichrist. And then the Apostle Paul goes on to speak about the mysterious restrainer. This is something that was holding back the Antichrist from manifesting himself, from actually revealing himself for what he was. Let's read that verse, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 6. And now you know, see they even knew this, they knew who the restrainer was. And now you know what is restraining, that he, that is the Antichrist, may be revealed in his time. Now, as we noticed in our last study, many Christians say, well, you see, the personal pronoun he here indicates that this is an individual, this is a person, because the personal pronoun he is used. But we noticed four reasons last time why, just because the personal pronoun he is used, it doesn't mean that it's speaking about an individual, but rather about a succession of individuals. In other words, a system. Now, there's an interesting detail here, and it is that the Apostle Paul does not actually identify the restrainer by name. Now, some Christians believe that the restrainer is the Holy Spirit, that when the Holy Spirit would be removed, then the Antichrist would be manifested. But I don't believe that the restrainer here that kept the Antichrist from revealing himself actually was the Holy Spirit. Because if it had been the Holy Spirit, the Apostle Paul would have had no problem identifying him. But the Apostle Paul here is using ambiguous language because he's saying, you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. In other words, there's some reason why the Apostle Paul does not identify the restrainer specifically by name. Now I want you to notice the comment that was made by the noted Bible commentary, Albert Barnes, a very famous Bible commentator. He had this to say about the meaning of the restrainer who was keeping the man of sin from manifesting himself. This is what he says. The belief among the primitive Christians was that what hindered, another word for restrained, what hindered the rise of the man of sin 
was the Roman Empire, and therefore they prayed for its peace and welfare, as knowing that when the Roman Empire should be dissolved and broken in pieces, don't forget that expression, and broken in pieces, the empire of the man of sin would be raised on its ruins. In other words, the restrainer was the Roman Empire. When the Roman Empire was broken or divided in many pieces, then a new empire would arise, which is the empire of the Antichrist. Now, in order to understand what the restrainer is, we must go back to the Old Testament prophecy that is uh, being spoken of by the Apostle Paul. Do you remember that in our, in our study last time, we talked a little bit about the little horn, the little horn who thought that it could change the law of God, that ruled for 1,260 years. Well, the fact is that Daniel chapter 7 shows us very clearly that the Roman Empire would be broken in pieces, and then when it was broken in pieces, the little horn or the Antichrist would arise. In fact, let's read Daniel chapter 7 and verses 23 and 24. Uh, Daniel chapter 7 and verses 23 and 24. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth. What does that fourth beast represent in Daniel 7? Remember Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and what? And Rome, very well. So it says, then he said, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all other kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, shall trample it and break it in pieces. And now notice what was going to happen to that empire. The ten horns are ten kings who shall what? Who shall arise from this kingdom. So was the kingdom of Rome going to be divided? Absolutely. And then who was going to arise when the empire was divided into pieces? Ah, notice it continues saying, and another shall rise after them, he shall be different from the first ones, and shall subdue three kings. Are you catching the picture? There's a restrainer. When the restrainer is taken out of the way, the Antichrist manifests himself. And we notice that the early Christians believed that when the Roman Empire was broken in pieces, the empire of the Antichrist would rise. Did they have it correct? Did they have it straight? They most certainly did. Incidentally, in Revelation chapter 13, if you go with me there, Revelation chapter 13 and verse 2, we notice the same sequence of the Roman Empire giving its throne and its power to the beast, which is the same as the little horn. Let's read that, Revelation 13 and verse 2. Now the beast, which is the same as the little horn, which I saw, the beast that ruled for 42 months or 1260 years, was like a leopard, his feet were like the feet of a bear, his mouth was like the mouth of a lion, and now notice the dragon, which is the fourth beast, which represents the Roman Empire, gave the beast his what? His power, his throne, and great authority. So where did the Antichrist get his power from? He got it from the fourth beast. He got it from the dragon beast. So Antichrist rises after the dragon beast has its fall after the dragon beast is divided into ten kingdoms. Is that point clear? So the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation 13 clearly show the sequence. The sequence is the Roman Empire would rule, the Roman Empire would be divided into ten kingdoms or broken up into ten kingdoms, and then the Antichrist would arise. So the question is, what was it that was restraining the Antichrist from manifesting himself? It must have been the previous power. It must have been the Roman Empire. Are you following me or not? In other words, it's the previous power. While the previous power is ruling, a new power cannot rule. The previous power has to be taken out of the way, and then the Antichrist could manifest himself. Now, let me ask you this. Was this Antichrist, at least the spirit of this Antichrist, wanting to manifest itself even in the days of the Apostle Paul? Absolutely, because he says there is something that is what? That is restraining it in the days of the Roman Empire. Now, you can't have some, something restraining this power unless the power is there. 
And so basically what you have here is that this, you have this antichrist spirit that is wanting to manifest itself and it's already there in the days of the Apostle Paul just waiting to manifest itself. Is this then speaking about a future antichrist that's going to arise after the rapture of the church? No. This antichrist power was always already wanting to manifest itself when? In the days of the Apostle Paul, he was already wanting to manifest his power. Now, allow me to give you a little bit of history. I'm going to read lots of quotations from historians in this presentation. That's why I've given you a copy of the lecture so that you can follow along. Now, I, I want to just go a little bit through the history. The Roman Empire, around the fourth century, started to be invaded by the barbarian tribes from the northern sector of the empire. And they began to carve up what had been the Roman Empire. In fact, by the year 476, the Roman Empire had been carved into ten pieces. In that year, 476, the last emperor of the Western Roman Empire fell. His name was Romulus Augustulus. After him, there was no emperor in Rome. Now, shortly before this, Constantine had transferred the capital of his kingdom to Constantinople or Istanbul, in the Eastern Roman Empire. And when he went to the Eastern Roman Empire, the Western Empire was left to the mercy of the barbarian tribes. There was no emperor, there was no law, there was no order. Everything was a disaster, everything was anarchy. Now allow me to read you a few statements here from historians about this period. Notice uh, from Alexander uh, Clarence Flick, in his book, The Rise of the Medieval Church, pages 168 and 169, he says this, the removal of the capital of the empire from Rome to Constantinople in 330 left the Western Church practically what? Well, is that an important word, free? If it, if it left it free, what was it before? It was restrained, absolutely. Practically free, from what? From imperial power. So what was restraining? The imperial power. Now it continues saying, the removal of the capital of the empire from Rome to Constantinople in 330 left the Western Church practically free from imperial power to develop its own form of organization. The Bishop of Rome, and now listen to this, in the seat of the what? Ah, it's a continuation of Rome, right? In the seat of the Caesars, was now the greatest man in the West and was soon forced to become the political as well as the spiritual head. Here's another historian, Philip Schaff, one of the greatest church historians in history, had this to say, when the Western Empire fell into the hands of the barbarians, the Roman bishop, which later was called the Pope, was the only surviving heir of this imperial past. Or, in the well-known dictum of Hobbes, the ghost of the deceased Roman Empire sitting crowned upon the grave thereof. Interesting, isn't it? So who is it that took the place of the Roman Empire? It was the Roman Catholic Papacy. Notice another comment, this is by the Roman Catholic James P. Conroy in the journal American Catholic Quarterly Review. He says, long ages ago, when Rome through the neglect of the Western emperors, was left to the mercy of the barbarous hordes, the Romans turned to one figure for aid and protection, and asked him to rule them. And thus, in this simple manner, the best title of all to kingly right commenced the temporal sovereignty of the popes. And meekly stepping to the throne of Caesar, listen to this, and meekly stepping to the throne of Caesar, the vicar of Christ took up the scepter to which the emperors and kings of Europe were to bow in reverence through so many ages. One final quotation from, uh, from Douglas Auchincloss in his article, City of God and Man, in Time magazine, this was in 1960, he had this to say, the all-conquering barbarians were storming the gates of Augustine City, that's Hippo in northern Africa, when the saint died in 430. 
The North African town of Hippo was one of the last imperial outposts to be attacked. Rome had already gone under. Only four years before St. Augustine's City of God had laid the theological groundwork for the church to step into the void left by the collapsing Roman Empire. Are you catching the picture? So what was restraining the Antichrist from being manifested? What was restraining was the existence of the Roman Empire. You see, while the Roman Empire was ruling, while you had an emperor in the West, then the Antichrist could not rule. The emperor had to be removed, and the first step was when Constantine moved the capital to Constantinople. The second step is when the barbarians began carving up the empire, which finally culminated in the last emperor being deposed in the year 476. Then, at that point, the empire had fallen, it had been divided into ten kingdoms, and now the restrainer was taken out of the way, and the Antichrist could manifest himself and fill the void that had been left by Rome. Now let me read you some statements by the early church fathers. They were living shortly before this period, and some of them were living during this period. They knew who the restrainer was. Listen to what Tertullian had to say. He was one of the renowned church fathers. He said this, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now hinders must what? Must hinder until he be what? Until he be taken out of the way. He, is he quoting 2 Thessalonians chapter 2? Most certainly. That's what he's commenting on. And now notice his question. What obstacle is there but the Roman state? The falling away of which, by being scattered into ten kingdoms, shall introduce Antichrist upon its own ruins, and then shall be revealed the wicked one. Is that clear? Absolutely crystal clear, folks. Tertullian understood that what hindered the manifestation of the Antichrist was the existence of the Roman state. That was the obstacle, according to him. Now notice what Tertullian also had to say in another place, and you have the references to this if you want to check them out. He said, the very end of all things, threatening dead, dreadful woes, is only retarded by what? By the continued existence of the Roman Empire. So what, what was going to happen when the Roman Empire was taken out of the way? He says, threatening dreadful woes which happened when the barbarians took over the Western Empire, there was no law and order. And so they said to the Bishop of Rome, why don't you rule over us, and why don't you put down some order? Notice what Ambrose had to say. This is another church father, Ambrose. He says, after the falling or decay of the Roman Empire, Antichrist shall appear. Notice also what Chrysostom had to say. And this is only a sampling. I have many more. I have about three pages of quotations from the church fathers where they understood that power that hindered or the restrainer as the Roman Empire. Chrysostom had to say, when the Roman Empire is taken out of the way, is that language from 2 Thessalonians 2? Absolutely. When the Roman Empire is taken out of the way, then the Antichrist shall come. And naturally, for as long as the fear of this empire lasts, no one will willingly exalt himself. But when that is dissolved, when the empire is dissolved, he will attack the anarchy and endeavor to seize upon the government of both whom? Of both man and of God. Interesting that the church fathers would believe that the restrainer was what? that the restrainer was the Roman Empire. Now we understand the reason why the Apostle Paul did not identify by name the restrainer. What if the Apostle Paul had told the Thessalonians, well you know that the restrainer is the Roman Empire, but the Roman Empire, when it's taken out of the way, then the Antichrist will be manifested. What would be a problem there? Oh, he'd have troubles with the Roman Empire, wouldn't he? Because the Roman Empire would say, you, we're going to be taken out of the way? Are you promoting the idea that the Roman Empire is going to fall? he would have been accused of sedition against the Roman Empire. And so the Apostle Paul, he says, you know what's restraining? 
The church fathers understood what was restraining, but he does not identify by name the restrainer because if he did, it would cause persecution of Christians. Are you understanding the reason why? If it had been the Holy Spirit, he would have clearly said, the Holy Spirit is restraining, because that would not be a, a difficult uh, idea for the Romans to accept. Now I want to read you an interesting uh, statement, actually a couple of statements from a Roman Catholic cardinal. His name is Cardinal Henry Edward Manning. Uh, he lived actually in the 19th century. Uh, he converted from the Anglican communion to the Roman Catholic Church right around the same time that John Henry Newman converted also from the Ang Anglican communion to the Roman Catholic Church. And I don't believe that, uh, in fact I know that uh, Cardinal Manning uh, really does not know the implications of what he says in these statements. He doesn't understand, but we, when we read it carefully we understand perfectly that he's writing about the removal of the empire and he's actually saying that the Roman Catholic Church is the predicted Antichrist, even though he doesn't say so and he doesn't believe that. But notice the language. The first statement is in his book, The Temporal Power of the Vicar of Jesus Christ. In the preface of the book he says this, listen carefully, now the abandonment of Rome He's speaking about Constantine, moving to the east. The abandonment of Rome was the what? What needs to happen if you're going to be liberated? You have to be restrained, right? So he says, now the abandonment of Rome was the liberation of the pontiffs. That is of the popes. Are you understanding what he's saying? He doesn't understand what he's saying. <laughs> he doesn't understand the implications as they apply to 2 Thessalonians 2. Now notice what he continues saying. saying the providence of God permitted a succession of eruptions. And then he mentions several barbarian tribes, Gothic, Lombard, and Hungarian, to desolate Italy and to efface from it every remnant of the empire. So what did the barbarians do? They effaced the remnants of the empire. In other words, the empire what? Fell. And then he says, the pontiffs found themselves alone the sole fountains of order, peace, law, and safety. So who stepped into the void? The pontiffs. He continues saying, and from the hour of this providential liberation, interesting, again the word, liberation, when by divine intervention the chains fell off from the successor of Peter. So what was, what was, uh, the problem with the success, successor of Peter before this. He was what? He was chained, he was restrained. But when the barbarians invaded, what happened? The bishop of Rome takes the ascendancy and the chains fall off, he's not restrained anymore. Notice what he continues saying, and from the hour of this providential liberation, when by a divine intervention the chains fell off from the hands of the successor of Peter, as once before his own, no sovereign has ever reigned in Rome except the vicar of Jesus Christ. Is that a significant statement? That is a powerful statement. Notice there's another one, uh, this is on pages 11 to 13 of the same book, The Temporal Power of the Vicar of Jesus Christ. He says this, it, that is the papacy, waited until such a time as God should break its bonds asunder. So what needed to happen? the bonds needed to be broken asunder and should liberate it from subjection to civil powers. Why could they be re, uh, released from subjection to civil powers? Because the Roman Empire what? Ceased to rule, it fell, there was no longer any emperor. And so he says, the papacy waited until such a time as God should break its bonds asunder and should liberate it from subjection to civil powers and enthrone it in the possession of a temporal sovereignty of its own. So who is the restrainer? The restrainer is the what? The Roman Empire. And when the Roman Empire was taken out of the way, then the Antichrist power could fill the void, could take the place of the empire that existed before. Now let me ask you, was there a specific time set apart for this? Absolutely. Is there a prophecy that says exactly when this power would rise and when this power would fall? You remember we studied about the little horn, how long was the little horn going to rule? 
time, times, and the dividing of time. Revelation chapter uh, 13 as well as uh, chapter, uh, well actually chapter 13 says that he would rule 42 months. Revelation chapter 12 says that this power would rule 1260 days, which are years. So was there a time specific when this power was going to manifest itself? Absolutely. Now notice what the Apostle Paul says next. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 6. He says, and now you know what is restraining. See, once again he doesn't identify the restrainer. He says, no, you know what you are restraining, what is restraining, that he may be revealed when? In his own time. Had God established a time when he was going to be manifested? Absolutely. Daniel 7 has the chronology of when he would be manifested. It would be when the empire was broken apart, the ten horns appeared, and then the little horn would be manifested. In other words, his time would come. Now let's go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 7. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 7. Was this power already wanting to manifest itself in the days of the Apostle Paul? Absolutely. So is this some future antichrist who is going to sit in a rebuilt Jerusalem temple? Absolutely not, because it was already wanting to manifest its power in the day of, days of Paul. So it already existed, the spirit of it existed in the days of Paul. Now notice 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 7. He's going to give a new name to this, uh, to this system. He says, for the mystery of what? Of lawlessness is already at work. Did you notice that previously he was called the man of what? Sin. Here it's called the mystery of what? Lawlessness. Is this apostasy going to have anything to do with God's law? Absolutely. What is sin? Transgression of the law, right? Interestingly enough, the two words that are used in 2 Thessalonians 2, sin, the man of sin, and the mystery of lawlessness, those are the very two words that are used in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4, where it says, sin is lawlessness. So this power was going to be a power that would attack God's law. Now obviously it wouldn't be an open attack, a blasphemous attack. It would be a camouflaged attack against law, against God's law. As it says in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 25, he would think to what? To change God's law. In that way he would attack God's holy law. And so it says, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work, the Apostle Paul says, even in his day. Only he, listen carefully, only he who now what? Who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And see Christians they say, see once again he means a person or an individual. Because it says very clearly here, it says he now restrains until he is taken out of the way. Actually, it's a very weak argument to say that the word he, that the personal pronoun he means that it's an individual or a person. Because I want you to notice in Romans chapter 13 that the Roman Empire is referred to with a personal pronoun, masculine also. Notice Romans chapter 13 and verses, uh, verse 4. Romans chapter 13 and verse 4. He's speaking about the Roman Empire. And notice what he says not speaking about a specific ruler of the Roman Empire. He says, for he is what? God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Now you read the context of those verses. It's talking about the rulers and the magistrates of Rome. It's not talking about a specific magistrate or a specific emperor, it's simply saying the Roman Empire is meant to keep the peace and to keep civil order. And notice that three times in this passage the personal pronoun masculine singular he is used to describe the Roman Empire. So if the he here can refer to the Roman Empire, then why can't the restrainer, who is referred to with the personal pronoun he, refer also to the Roman Empire? Are you understanding my point? Now, do you know that the Bible teaches 
that this power was not only going to rule in the past, but this power was also going to rule in the future. The Bible says that at the end of its first stage it would receive a deadly wound. But then its deadly wound would be what? Its deadly wound would be healed. Now let's read once again 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 7, and then we'll come to this uh, aspect of the healing of the deadly wound just for a few moments. Verse 7 says, For now the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is what? What does that expression indicate? Taken out of the way. Is it a case that he says, oh, okay, I'm just going to move and you just move in. No. Somebody is what? Taking him out of the way. Who were the ones that took the Roman Empire out of the way? The barbarian invasions took the empire out of the way. And the barbarian invasions came because Constantine moved the capital of the empire to the east, and as a result, the western Roman Empire was greatly weakened. Now, I mentioned that this power's, uh, this power's um, strength is going to be seen again. In other words, its deadly wound, which it, which it received in 1798, when the pope was taken prisoner, and he died in exile in France, he's going to be healed from that wound, and he's going to rule again. Now let me read you a very significant statement that was written by Malachi Martin. Now let me explain who Malachi Martin was. He was a Jesuit Roman Catholic priest. He died a few years ago. He was also an exorcist. And he wrote a very famous book called The Keys of This Blood. But this statement in Christianity today is a very interesting statement. You know, the papacy lost its power in 1798, which was the culmination of the French Revolution. The French Revolution began in 1789, and it continued till 1798. The Pope taken prisoner was the climax of the spirit of the French Revolution. That's when the papacy lost its ability to use the civil powers of the world to accomplish its purposes. Now notice what Malachi Martin has to say here in uh, Christianity Today, November 21, 1986. He says, for 1,500 years and more, Rome, he means pa the papacy, Rome had kept as strong a hand as possible in each local community around the wide world. What had the papacy done according to him for 1,500 years and more? It had kept as strong a hand as possible in each local community around the world. And then he says this, by and large, and admitting some exceptions, that had been the Roman view. What had been the Roman view? It had kept as strong a hand as possible in each local community around the whole world. That was the Roman view. Now notice, by and large, and admitting some exceptions, that had been the Roman view until 200 years of inactivity had been what? Imposed upon the papacy by whom? By the major secular powers of the world. Was this power restrained again? After it received its deadly wound, was it restrained again? Who restrained it? The major what? Secular powers of the world. Now let me ask you, in order for its wound to be healed, what must happen? It must be able once again to rule the secular powers of the world. Are you with me? In other words, it must be able to use the states of the world to accomplish its purposes. Now, the interesting thing is this. This is being written in 1986. And he's saying that 200 years up till that point have been imposed, of inactivity have been imposed upon the papacy. So let's go back from 1986, 200 years because that's a period of inactivity, according to him, imposed by the major secular powers of the world. You go back, where, that, where does that take you? It takes you back to 1786. And that's very near to what? To the period of the deadly wound and the French Revolution. So let me ask you, what was it that took away the power from the Roman Catholic papacy, according to this Roman Catholic theologian? 
it was the French Revolution and when the Pope was taken captive to France. He says since then the major secular powers of the world have imposed upon this system what? Inactivity. Now let me read you a statement from Ellen White. This is an amazing statement. It's found in Great Controversy 564. She says that that restraint is going to be removed. This is what she says. Let the restraints, notice the terminology, let the restraints now imposed by secular governments be removed and Rome be reinstated in her former power and there would speedily be a revival of her tyranny and persecution. Are you understanding that statement? It's a powerful statement. What she's saying is that the papacy has a deadly wound. She says that it needs to be reinstated and there would speedily be a revival. In order to have a revival it has to be what? Inactive. And what is it that will lead to her revival? The taking away of the what? Of the restraints imposed by what? By the secular governments of the world. In Great Controversy page 581 she says this, Rome is aiming to re establish her power. You can't re-establish something that wasn't established first. She's aiming to re-establish her power, to recover her lost supremacy. And then she says how it's going to happen. Let the principle once be established in the United States that the church may employ or control the power of the state, that religious observances may be enforced by secular laws, in short, that the authority of church and state is to dominate the conscience and the triumph of Rome in this country is assured. Now let me read you a statement from a reformed theologian. He's actually quoting Ayn Rand. And uh, this woman was a novelist, a philosopher, a playwright, a screenwriter, a multi-talented person. And notice what she said all the way back in 1967. The Catholic Church has never given up the hope to re-establish the medieval union of church and state with a global state and a global theocracy as its ultimate goal. The Roman church state is a hybrid, a monster of ecclesiastical and political power. Its political thought is totalitarian, and whenever it has had the opportunity to apply its principles, the result has been bloody repression. If during the last 30 years it has softened its assertions of full supreme and irresponsible power and has murdered fewer people than before. Such changes in behavior are not due to a change in its ideas but to a change in its circumstances. What are those circumstances? It is restrained by the secular powers of the world. The governments do not allow her to lord it over them like in the Middle Ages. He continues saying, or she continues saying, the Roman church state in the 20th century, however, is an institution recovering from a mortal wound. And then she says this, if and when, I would take away the if because it's a matter of when, but she says if and when it regains its full power and authority, it will impose a regime more sinister than any the planet has yet seen. Is the restraint going to be removed? Absolutely. What was the restraints in the times of the Apostle Paul? The secular power was ruling and the religious power was bound. What happened when the secular power was removed? The chains fell off. In 1798 what happened? The cuffs were put back on by the civil powers of the world. When will the, when will the cuffs fall off again? When the secular powers of the world step back and they say, we'll do as you say we're supposed to do. It's that simple. Now the Bible tells us what this final controversy is going to be about. This is the man of sin. This is the mystery of lawlessness. The end time controversy is going to have to do with God's holy law. That's why Revelation 12 verse 17, a very famous verse in Adventist circles says, and the dragon was enraged with the woman and went to make war with the rest of her offspring who what? 
who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Satan hates those who keep the commandments. And so does the man of sin, who is the representative of the mystery of lawlessness, who claims to have had the power to change God's holy law. Can any human being change God's holy law? Absolutely not. By the way, most of the attack on God's law is an attack on the first table of the law. The Bible says that this power is going to sit in the temple of God, showing himself to be God. Is he breaking the first commandment, thou shalt have no other gods before me? Is he going to raise an image and command everyone to worship the image? Does that involve the second commandment? Thou shalt not make any gra graven image? Absolutely. How about the third commandment? Don't take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Does this power blaspheme the name of God by claiming to exercise the power and prerogatives of God? Yes. Is this power a power that attacks God's holy Sabbath by claiming to have changed Sabbath to Sunday? Yes. In other words, the final attack is against the first table of God's holy law. Primarily. Not primarily against the second table of the law. Now the Bible predicts some amazing things that are going to happen in the future. Once this power regains its authority and regains its throne, as Ayn Rand said, said, it will establish a regime more sinister than any the planet has yet seen. And it's going to do it not only through force, but through deception. Let's continue our study in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 9. It says here, the coming, you know what that word is, coming there? It's the word parousia. Is the Antichrist also going to have his parousia? Is it going to be before the parousia of Christ? Absolutely. There's going to be a counterfeit parousia by the Antichrist. The same word is used as we studied before. And so it says the coming of the lawless one. Notice once again the emphasis on lawless. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of whom? Of Satan with all power, signs, and what? And lying wonders. Are all miracles from God? You know, I was once talking to an individual who belonged to a charismatic church. And he says, you Adventists got have the truth, but we've got the spirit. And I said, I said, we've got the truth, but you don't have the spirit. And he says, what do you mean? I said, the Bible says that we're supposed to worship God in spirit and in truth. We cannot worship God in the spirit without the truth, and we cannot worship God in truth without the spirit. They have to go together. He says, well, we have signs and wonders. We have miracles, and we speak in tongues, and we have healings and all these things. I said, so does the devil. In fact, let's continue reading here. Don't depends on sign, depend on signs and wonders and miracles, because the devil can counterfeit the genuine. Notice what we find in Acts chapter 2 and verse 22. Acts chapter 2 and verse 22. This is speaking about the miracles that were performed by Jesus. Now you notice three words that we just read in 2 Thessalonians 2.9. It says the Antichrist will come with power, signs, and lying wonders. Now there's only one other verse in the Bible that uses those three identical words. They're not translated the same, but they're the same three words. And they refer to the miracles that Christ performed. Acts 2 and verse 22. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs. Those are the identical three words. Which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. So what is the Antichrist going to do? He's going to perform the same signs and wonders that who performed? That Jesus Christ performed. Only the Antichrist does it by the power of Satan, according to what we just read. Whereas Jesus performed these things by the power of whom? By the power of God. In fact, this prophecy tells us that Satan is going to counterfeit the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now you say, where does the Bible say that? Go with me to Matthew chapter 24. This isn't in your list. I added afterwards, Matthew 24 and verse 23 through verse 27. And we'll read this quickly. Matthew chapter 24 and verses 23 through 27. This is at the very end of the tribulation period. And notice once again signs and wonders and miracles through which the devil is going to try and deceive people. 
It says there in verse 23, Then if anyone says to you, Look, here is the Christ, or there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great what? Signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even whom? Even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. Now notice, is there going to be someone who's going to counterfeit the second coming of Christ? Listen carefully, verse 26, Therefore if they say to you, look, he is in the desert, do not go out. Or look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Ellen White calls this the almost overmastering delusion. In fact, let me read you the description that she gives that she saw in vision of how Satan is going to counterfeit the second coming of Christ. This is in Great Controversy, page 624. It's a rather long passage, but it's very significant. She says, As the crowning act in the great drama of deception, Satan himself will personate Christ. The church has long professed to look to the Savior's advent as the consummation of her hopes. Now the great deceiver will make it appear that Christ has come. In different parts of the earth, Satan will manifest himself among men as a majestic being of dazzling brightness, resembling the description of the Son of God given by John in the Revelation. The glory that surrounds him is unsurpassed by anything that mortal eyes have yet beheld. The shout of triumph rings out upon the air, Christ has come, Christ has come. If you believe that Jesus is coming back to this earth to establish his kingdom here for a thousand years, you're going to be deceived. Now notice what she continues saying. The people prostrate themselves in adoration before him. These are Christians, folks. And he lifts up his hands and pronounces a blessing upon them. As Christ blessed his disciples when he was upon the earth. His voice is soft and subdued, yet full of melody. In gentle, compassionate tones he presents some of the same gracious heavenly truths which the Savior uttered. He heals the diseases of the people. And then, in his assumed character of Christ, he claims to have changed the Sabbath to Sunday and commands all to hallow the day which he has blessed. He declares that those who persist in keeping holy the seventh day are blaspheming his name by refusing to listen to his angels sent to them with light and truth. This is the strong, almost overmastering delusion. Interesting, she's referring to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. That's where the language comes from. This is the strong, almost overmastering delusion. How are God's people going to know that this isn't really Christ? By two things. First, we need to know how Jesus is going to come. You know, I once heard a minister, an Adventist minister said, I don't care how Jesus is coming, I only care that he is coming. Let me tell you, if you don't know how he is coming, you probably will accept the wrong he. Because you have to know how he's coming, that's the first way, and secondly, you have to know what the Bible teaches. Now notice what she continues saying, but the people of God will not be misled. The teachings of this false Christ are not in accordance with the scriptures. So what do we compare everything with? The scriptures. His blessing is pronounced upon the worshipers of the beast and his image, the very class upon whom the Bible declares that God's unmingled wrath shall be poured out. And then she says not only are his teachings contrary to the Bible, but then she speaks about the manner of Christ's coming. And furthermore, Satan is not permitted to counterfeit the manner of Christ's advent. The Savior has warned his people against deception upon this point, and has clearly foretold the manner of his second coming. There shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east, and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. This coming, there is no possibility of counterfeiting. It will be universally known, witnessed by the whole world. So every eye is going to see him simultaneously. Don't ask me to scientifically explain that. But the Bible says so, and I believe it. 
and he is not going to touch the earth. He's going to be above the earth, and we are going to be gathered together to him. He said so in verse 1. Not him gathered to us, we gathered to him, and then he is going to take us to his father's house. So if any individual comes, even if he looks like Christ and performs miracles and walks on the earth and speaks beautiful words like Jesus spoke, if he's walking on the earth, that is not Christ. And we're not supposed to go out and even look. She, she ends this statement by saying, only those who have been diligent students of the scriptures and who have received the love of the truth will be shielded from the powerful delusion that takes the world captive by the Bible testimony, these will detect the deceiver in his disguise. How important is it to study the Bible and strengthen your mind with scripture? It is a matter of life and death, and the, and the church has gone far astray from scripture, justifying all kinds of practices that are contrary to scripture in the name of culture. It's not culture that dictates what we believe and what we practice. It's God's holy word that dictates what Christians should do and what they should speak and where they should go and what they should eat and when they should worship and how they should worship. God has given indications on all of these things. Now let's go to verse 10 because our time is running out. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 10. Why are most people going to be deceived? Listen carefully. It says that the Antichrist will come with all unrighteous deception among those who perish. Why? Listen, because, here's the reason why they're going to perish, because they did not receive what? The love of the truth that they might be saved. How important is it to know the truth and follow the truth? It's a matter of life and death, folks. And where do we find truth? On CNN. <laughs> well, there's some truth in, in CNN. Oh, the New York Times? No, what our preacher says? Maybe some truth. But where do we find absolute and undiluted truth? In God's Word. And so it says, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. Jesus said in John 17 and verse 17, sanctify them by your truth, that is make them holy by your truth. Your word is truth. By the way, the Bible also says that God's law is the truth. Psalm 119 and verse 142 says, your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness and your law is what? Your law is truth. And so what is the issue going to be at the end of time? The issue is very simple. Do you obey God's commandments because you love him? Are you willing even to die to be loyal to God? Not as a legalist, but as someone who loves Jesus so much that you're not willing to bend your knee to anyone else, to the beast, his image, or receive his mark, because your love for Jesus is number one. That is going to be the issue. Just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. For them, being loyal to God, and not bowing before the image which was raised up by Nebuchadnezzar was more important than life itself. They live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And now I want to end by going to verses 11 and 12. Verses 11 and 12. The Bible says that because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved, something happens. It says, and God will send them. Now the Bible uh, attributes to God what God allows. You understand that? It's not that God is deluding people. It's that these people did not want to receive the love of the truth, and so God says, I'm not going to force the truth on you. I'll just, with, just withdraw. And with, when God withdraws, then they're deluded. Are you understanding what this is saying? It's not that God deludes people or deceives people, because God does not deceive anyone. He wants everyone to be saved. And so it says, and for this reason, God will send them strong delusion. In other words, he will allow them to be deluded that they should believe the lie. Now listen carefully. This is not that they should believe a lie. The word lie here has the definite article, the lie. What lie is this referring to? According to the context, what is the lie? 
the counterfeit what? The counterfeit second coming of Christ. That they should believe the lie. In other words, the counterfeit parousia. So because they did not receive the love of the truth, they believed the lie. And the word lie here is the word pseudos, which means false, counterfeit. That they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned, who did not, once again the same idea, who did not believe what? The truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Folks, the only standard in this world that we can trust in is God's word. Not science, not philosophy, not historians. Not that they don't have some truth. We need to compare what they say with scripture. But the ultimate authority by which we test everything in this world to determine whether it's true or false is the absolute standard of God's holy word. As Jesus said when he was in the Mount of Temptation, the devil used all kinds of, of, of temptations to try and get Jesus to sin. But every time that the devil came to Jesus, Jesus didn't say, well, I, I don't think that what you're saying is right. Or, you know, it, it, it doesn't look right. Or it doesn't feel right. Or it doesn't sound right. That wasn't the standard that Jesus applied. Every single time, all three times, when the devil came, Jesus said what? It is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. It's my prayer that we will make the choice of living by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, no matter what it might cost. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul?